Welcome to Conscious Co-Creation, straight talk about the mind, body, business, spirit, interconnection. And I am really excited today because today I have the beautiful Andrea Adler with me. And she's a beautiful, prolific writer and author and speaker. And we're going to be talking today about a lot of beautiful things in the spiritual realm. We're going to be talking about the beautiful book, obviously, that I have right here, Pushing Upward. And we're also going to be talking about the I Ching. We're going to be talking about some consciousness. I'm going to bring it over to her for her to explain about this beautiful book. And then we're going to dive into a lot of beautiful things. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Carly. It's great to be here. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this. It's exciting. It's my first Google Hangout. Oh, they're fun. First, so first of all, I'd like for you to share a little bit about what was the inspiration behind this beautiful book? Well, thank you. Um, it actually, you know, 90% of this story is my story. Uh, the other five, 10% is uh, protecting the guilty. So I'm calling it fiction. Um, you know, I walked around in the 70s when this book took place as if I had antennas on my head. And I remember recording every single piece of dialogue and every move I made and every person that I met and I never could quite understand why I paid so much attention why I was so acutely, acutely aware of what was going on at the time and I kept asking myself why are you paying so much attention to everything and little did I know much later that it was to be recorded at a later date and so I remembered every single Thing that people said and you know people go well how did you remember all that I said there was no way that I couldn't remember it was like <laughs> so vivid in my mind that I had to record everything and I didn't even know why at the time but it was very easy to remember all this dialogue and the things that had happened the challenging part of course was what do I leave in what do I leave out the editing process you know the little things that take 10 years to create you know but it's a love story uh, it's a love story about a woman that I met through a newspaper ad that changed my life that gave me more love than I ever received in my life and you know so I owe that whole time period to this 80 year old woman and the I Ching that I actually discovered in my in the 70s not in my 70s but in the 70s um, I, wait, I want to stop you one thing here now some people are going what is the I Ching so let's actually tell people what the I Ching is before you continue so the I Ching or I Ching is an ancient the ancient Chinese divination tool it is actually one of the oldest divination tools known to man uh, it's a combination of Taoism and Confucianism and many of the kings of that day and masters of that day added to the commentaries the 64 commentaries that are included in the I Ching and there have been about oh I can't even count the hundreds of different um, I Ching books that there are and most of them have been based on the Wilhelm Baines version for me, that's the quintessential book written about the I Ching, and it was uh, translated by Wilhelm from Chinese to German and Baines from German to English. And to me, that is the richest I Ching out there. And there are some really wonderful, uh, more contemporary I Ching books that help decipher the commentaries and make it more understandable and digestible for people for today. Um, I, I just love this Wilhelm Baines version because even though it's kind of sexist and they only use the man and references to the man, the commentaries are so complex and even if you can't understand them intellectually, they affect you viscerally and somatically. And I think why I have fallen in love with the I Ching and continue to use the I Ching is because of its profound synchronicity and even Carl Jung who as we know is a well-known psychologist and brilliant man who said before he died 
Had he had 50 more years added to his life, it would be to study the I Ching because of its profound synchronicity. And he wrote volumes on synchronicity. So when we think of divination, even the Bible talks, you know, is a divination tool. When we drive around the streets and we're praying to God and we say, Dear God, you know, give me a sign. Am I supposed to move? Am I supposed to sell the car? Whatever it is, am I supposed to marry this man? Give me a sign. We're asking for that divine intervention. And there are tools, you know, there's the astrology tool, there's the tool of the tarot, the I Ching, and whatever people gravitate to, you know, is wonderful. I just happen to gravitate to the I Ching and its, its complex ability to answer questions I didn't even know I had. Perfect. I just wanted to clarify that a little bit because we're, t you know, we're talking about your book and you're talking about the I Ching and, and for some people it's the I Ching. You know, I just wanted to make sure that we clarified that just a little bit before you continued on your journey with the book. So thank you so well, much. Inter yeah. Sure. Interestingly enough, I was um, doing research and talking to some I Ching masters about the I Ching and their history of it. And, you know, it's like people who come from India, they want nothing to do with gurus because their whole lives they've been around gurus and their parents had a guru and you know then they come to the states and they meet a guru I'm finding that people from China who have grown up with you know their parents throwing the I Ching and do it they wanted nothing to do with it and now they come to the states and they read my book and they go oh my god the I Ching this contemporary girl in the 70s, you know, with mood rings and earrings, you know, she was using the I Ching. So it's being reintroduced in a way, which makes it fascinating for me because I, I'm so happy to be bringing this book back into the consciousness of the people of today. So, you know, what is exactly consciousness? You know, we talk, everyone just throws the term out, consciousness. And I know you and I have had conversations many times about consciousness. What is consciousness to you? I think consciousness is an understanding and a depth of understanding and perhaps even a detachment from our own myopic point of view of the world, but sort of this detached understanding of what is going on globally, what is going on internally, and how we interpret that. And, you know, we kind of gravitate toward people who are of like minds and who have a certain consciousness, a certain understanding of the planet and our place in it. That's my only, you know, I've never really been asked that question and it's an interesting contemplation, and that's the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> now, in the book, obviously, you're one of the characters. And so I'd love to ask you the question, going to consciousness, actually, and obviously you took a journey in this book. So where would you say that, as that character, obviously you evolved in consciousness with the I Ching. Where do you think that all started for you? Well, here's a girl who grew up in a small town in Michigan, like many girls do, and then come out to California or New York to pursue a theatrical career. And all of a sudden, this city is overwhelming, and the choices that they have to make are overwhelming. And sometimes they have family members that they're close to in proximity, or they can call on the phone. I had neither one. So I felt like a waif in the wind and I wasn't being able to um, be coached by anyone. There was no mentor around. There were so many questions that I was being bombarded with and I felt completely unraveled. And so when I walked into the Bodhi Tree bookstore and found this book that literally moved me in the direction of the Eastern religions, it was just compelling. And it like the book almost fell off the shelf. It started shimmering. 
I mean, it was calling me in so many ways. It was bizarre. Anyway, after picking up that book and reading it for the first time, I felt like a duck had found water. And I felt so nourished that it was answering some deep-rooted questions about consciousness, about how to live a life of Dharma, about how to navigate my life. And so I became a fanatic. You know, it's like five times a day I'd be throwing these coins to answer, to ask the question and then have the I Ching interpret it for me. Now what's interesting about the I Ching is because <laughs> you cannot take it lightly and you cannot abuse it. And if you start abusing it, it will not give you the answers that you want. Very fascinating. Um, and so this book helped me to make decisions and helped me understand my own process of making decisions. Now I'm at a point in my life where I almost say, what would the I Ching say about this? And then I don't even have to throw the coins. And sometimes I do just to get a second opinion. And that's really what divine intervention is all about. It's getting that second opinion. We already know the answers deep inside if we're really listening, which is why I started meditating and have been for 37 years. It's because I wanted the answers to come from within, not having to go to a book. However, it's an amazing tool to get you to that place. So on this girl's journey, she discovers this book, the I Ching, and she comes to a place in her career where she no longer wants to sell shoes or work a nine-to-five job, and she doesn't know what to do. So she decides to place an ad, drama student in need of room and board in exchange for housekeeping. She's looking, like, what's out there? And she meets some very crazy, dangerous men in the process. A few zany women, uh, including somebody that lives, you know, on the on a boat, which would not give her the stability that she's looking for. Um, and then she meets this 80-year-old mysterious woman, who somehow gives her a feeling of safety. And even though she's way older than the roommate she had anticipated, there was a safety net there. And I moved in. I go she or I, it's the same person, but I moved in with this woman and she whipped me into shape. And I have the I Ching to thank for that decision because it validated by throwing the coins, it came up with the hexagram pushing upward. So it was showing me that I would be pushing upward and it has a whole commentary about pushing upward and what I am to expect from this relationship if I make this move. So that's why I called the book Pushing Upward. It's based on the hexagram number 46 of the I Ching book. So that is a, a marvelous thing. And I think, you know, I think, now that's the thing about making decisions based on tools and divination tools. And like you said, not abusing them. I think too many people take the tarot cards or the angel cards or divination tools and like you said, they kind of use them. They base every single decision on those tools. And I think, like you said, it's, it's, it's kind of like an ebb and a flow or a balance of when to use and when not to use and when to, and at times using our own intuition, our own inner guidance and having that balance. And, and not, Every, everything can become an addiction, you know. Right, exactly. Everything in moderation, whether right. it's food or drink or the I Ching or the Tarot. One thing that I don't do in moderation is meditate. Mm -hmm. I meditate every single day. Good for because you. Because that does bring me great peace. It helps me to connect to source. So I am making decisions from a place of equanimity and balance. And believe me, there were times when I wasn't meditating, and the first thing my son would say when we lived in the same house was, I guess you didn't meditate today, huh, Mom? Because he would know. So 
I attribute the state of my consciousness today on meditation, for sure. Now, you also know about what other things that you use. What other things do you use med with meditation? Because I know we've, we've met at other forums that we've, you know, you and I have gone to other things like sound vibratory music and other things with meditation. What have you found has been very helpful with meditation? Well, chanting, for one, opens up the heart. Uh, it relieves stress. Uh, it creates a vibration in yourself that actually helps you to meditate. And as well with Hatha Yoga. If I don't stretch in the morning before I sit, I'm not able to sit as long or as comfortably. So the three of those are really symbiotic uh, in my estimation. The stretching of the body so I can sit properly and longer and the chanting to open up the heart and become a channel and a vessel for the information and so I'm vibrating at a higher elevation so to speak because the days that I chant become a whole different day than when I don't and the same with meditation and the same with Hatha Yoga so it's those three things that really create this um, really beautiful balance that support each other and every decision I make that day. Now when did you discover meditation and chanting yoga and, and hatha yoga? Did that also start at an early age or is that something you developed as you got older? That came uh, around the same time period in the 70s when I was you know pretty neurotic <laughs> as an actress and you know we are trained as actors to keep our emotions very high and accessible and so of course we're going to be very emotional beings because of that training and so I had been trained to be emotional to be able to act on the spot I'm still that way in a way because of all the training and because I am just emotional <laughs> And I guess that makes me a good writer, too, because I'm able to share those emotions on the page. And so I started with TM, and uh, I loved it. You know, I was very disciplined uh, with Transcendental Meditation, and it helped me a lot. And then I moved into another yoga, which uh, I'm not going to mention, but it, it's another path that took me much deeper into my sadhana my spiritual evolution and I've been pretty much on that path for 37 years. Good for you. I, and now how do you also, in terms of a lot of people find that, you know, a path of food also, in other words, how they eat also helps with their, with their meditation, not eating before they meditate, um, having an empty stomach. Do you really, do you find that to be so? Well, I tell you, I could do a whole course on eating. <laughs> and, you know, it was a big issue for me in the 70s, you know, trying to stay thin, try, you know, being emotional, wanting to stuff down my feelings. It's pretty much written out in the book as well. Um, so eating plays a huge role in our lives, in meditation. Um, it's not just about moderation, it's about eating as if it were medicine. You know, eating because we're taking the greens because we know the chlorophyll is so great for us. We're drinking water because we know we need a certain amount of water. Um, I actually learned more about eating and the discipline of eating in India. Yeah when uh, my teacher, when I literally could not stop eating and my teacher put me on a regimen of one rupee a day and in India you couldn't buy anything for one rupee a day so that was his sense of humor <laughs> which meant that I had to eat in the hall at the times in which the meals were given and not in between because when he gave a direction of one, one rupee a day 
and there was nothing for one rupee, it started at two rupees, it meant that I couldn't buy anything. So I literally just ate my meals in the hall, which I began to really, really love. Because when you're hungry, food tastes a little differently than when you're just stuffing your face for other reasons. So it got to a point in India where if I took one half a teaspoon more than I needed, I'd be asleep the rest of the day. So I learned how to discipline my food intake in India. Now it became a whole different story when I came back to the States. It wasn't about the rupee or no rupee. I had to just key in to see when it was enough. When do I need to stop? And now I pretty much just eat two meals a day, and that's it. That's all I need. We really need so little, it's embarrassing. <laughs> and the older we get, the less we need. At least for me. If I gain five pounds, I'm a mess. I don't like it. My feet hurt. My knees hurt. I'm just a walking, you know, I'm on a tightrope. But it makes it's a very difference. Very true. I think I think America right now we have an epidemic of obesity and diabetes, and you know our culture is just a mess when it comes to food. We definitely the holidays. You know, it's just incredible the amount. The holidays of food. are the best time to fast. Exactly, <laughs> I agree. I, I, I used to go I, on a program called Maintenance, <laughs> and Maintenance was about only eating exactly what I needed and really paying attention and then not eating anymore and then drinking water all day and then if I felt the slightest hunger I would just like take a teaspoon of something and that would be it and you start to see how you need so little to sustain yourself but it's then, then the key though is is that what you are eating you're getting high volume of nutrients though because then if you don't do that then you have a whole nother set of problems so it's kind of like what you are eating has to be definitely dense in nutrients so you have you know that's the other key in, in being trained in what you what you are eating has to be definitely superfoods not only that everybody's different you yeah, know, that's some true people too. Need fish. Some people need chicken. Mm -hmm. Some people need grass-fed beef. Yeah. Which, what I recommend if you do want to ha have beef. I mean, we have the sources out there. Unfortunately, we don't have the soil that we had before, so we're needing extra vitamins and minerals and nutrients yeah. to add to our food. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't. I don't buy the whole thing. You have to be vegan. You have to be. I mean, everybody's body is different, and the whole that. That's when I get really agitated with people with the cookie, the cookie mold. You know, one size fits everybody, and that's not true. I that's mean, true. the whole and that's the whole thing. It has to be all Western. It has to be all Eastern. You know, you can't do any Western meds whatsoever. You, you know, you have to do only Eastern, it, and it just doesn't work that way. It's like everybody's body is different, and for some but, people, if they didn't do Western meds, they'd be dead. And for some people, I totally get that Eastern Eastern way is the only way for them. It's just that yeah. you have yeah. to know the individual and what they're going through. I mean, Western medicine has literally, I mean, some people wouldn't be alive without the heart transplant or the liver transplant or whatever. Right, right, you know, right. So Thank God, God for allopathic it. medicine. Right, yeah. exactly. We can't poo-poo everything. It's like, you know, everything is different for everybody. And we have to honor that. And, and, and that, you know, and that, that is the way it is. Now getting, you know, let's there's, get, there's the macrobiotic, you know, regime. There's the Ayurvedic oh, regime. Oh, there's so many raw foods. What I suggest is get it, get in touch with each one of them. Exactly. And see what works for you, and maybe it's a collaboration, collaboration of them all. You know, on when it's hot and it's summer, I I pretty much eat a raw food diet because I don't want anything hot and cooked. In exactly. the winter, as soon as it changes, boy, and I'm Vata, I want those hot soups. Mm -hmm. I want lima bean soup. I want the thick, rich, you know, hot foods. And my body needs it. So it's always questioning, what do I need? How much do I need? But if you're not even asking those questions, 
that's when disease takes over. It's true. I don't. I don't think you know eating one way all the time is healthy either. I agree with you. I do. I I cycle all different things. There are times I'm doing vegan. There are times I am at putting in a little bit of grass fed something. Um, I'm always changing things around depending on what my body is requiring or needing. Oh, and my body says you need some fish for your brain. I'm out the door getting it. <laughs> but I also eat a lot of seaweed, which is very high in Oh, energy. I love seaweed. It's my, my my favorite thing when I go to sushi sushi <laughs> restaurants is seaweed salad. I, I love sushi. seaweed yeah. salad. It's yeah. my favorite. Yeah. Absolute favorite. So getting back to your journey, I'd love to feel I want I'd love for everyone to um, get the rest of your journey of the book because the, the book is absolutely fabulous. Thank so you. getting back to your to your relationship with this eighty year old woman. So where does she take you on your journey? Well, I think she what she did most importantly was give me space to find out who I was. Just her allowing me to be in her space, even though it was very, very small, and her husband was a really great artist, and there were pictures on every single wall. You could hardly see the walls. There were so many pictures. And when I first walked in there, I went, oh my God, how am I going to live here? I feel so, you know, claustrophobic. And all of a sudden, the more I stood there and the more I walked around and the more I was in her presence, I realized this is a very expansive place. And whatever love she is about to give me, she obviously gave to her own husband which is why he was able to create these masterpieces I'm now seeing on these walls. And I got it so fast that I was able to relax and move into that little tiny bedroom and feel more expanded than I had ever felt. And then she was, you know, a disciplinarian for sure. You know, I don't want to give the book away too much, but she had me work to develop my craft. You know, it was one oh. thing going to acting school and learning acting from the inside out. You know, when I worked with Stella Adler and I worked with some incredible people, uh, the Actors Studio, I mean, I took, I was very, very serious actress. But the what ad I learned was from barter her, and trade. So she said she, she, you said she made you work. And so it was a barter and trade. So I, I, her, I, I give her credit for making you work. Well, she didn't make me work in the house. Oh, okay. I hardly did any work in the house. You know, the, the ad said in exchange for housekeeping, I did very little of that. <laughs> and plus, I didn't even know how to cook. So she was showing me how to make matzo ball soup and, you know, all these wonderful meals that, you know, I had no, I'd never spent time in the kitchen before ever. So we explored that journey together too. Well, that sounds wonderful. That I was, do have to let everybody know that we are on Intention Radio, and I really encourage everyone to go check it out. It's www.intentionradio.com. And also, I encourage everyone to go check out the intentioncall.com. It's a great group of people that every Saturday at 3 p.m., they have a group of people that get together and pick out some intention to intend upon. So please go check that out. And the Intention Radio has beautiful hosts, and it's a great group of people that are all conscious. So please go check out intentionradio.com. And we are going to be spending the rest of this radio show talking about more consciousness and spirituality and pushing upwards. So please welcome back Andrea Adler. And Andrea, since this is a podcast, can you please let everyone know where they can find you. This is not just a video, it's also a podcast, so please let everyone know where they can find you. Well, I have two websites. Uh, the Pushing Upward website, uh, pushingupward.com, and it has some really wonderful videos about I Ching experts that have used the I Ching, and when they followed it, uh, what would happen to them, and when they didn't follow it, what would happen to them. And some great video testimonials of the book. Um, Amazon is selling the book like crazy. Uh, this won the Los Angeles Book Festival Award and also it was picked up by Hay House, they're the publisher. And it was actually one of Hay House's 
first fiction books out of their gate. They normally do nonfiction with Marianne Williamson and Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra. But this, I was very honored that this was one of their first transformational fiction books out of their house. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, the other website is Holistic PR because for years I've been referred to as the metaphysical marketer and created a holistic methodology to help small business owners and entrepreneurs understand their business from this very conceptual, philosophical, esoteric, and practical way to understand their business, how to share their story. And I still dabble in that. I still love helping uh, entrepreneurs to grow their business. I, in fact, have given one idea that have made three people millionaires. <laughs> so I really love doing that. I'm also helping uh, young actresses develop one-woman shows now. So I'm really excited about that. So and I think that is holisticpr.com, correct? Yes, holisticpr.com and pushingupward.com. And Amazon now has uh, 33, I believe, five-star reviews. So it's getting a lot of notice, and people like you, thank you, helping to get the word out there about the book. And there's a few producers looking at the book to make it into a film, so we'll see. If you're a producer out there and interested in a fabulous women's story, and we need women's stories, we need powerful women's stories so badly, uh, just to give our youth you know, a direction. Uh, I think the zeitgeist for me with this book has been a really interesting journey to discover because teenagers who are questioning, you know, what is it going to be like when they're 20 are reading this book. Uh, generation X, Y, and Z who are wait wanting to navigate next steps and not sure how to do that. Uh, baby boomers who are reflecting on the 70s and going, oh my god, I remember what that was like. And then they're gifting their kids the book. If you want to know what my youth was like, read this book. Um, New Agers who want to dive back into divine intervention and the divine milieu of um, divine intervention. Seniors who, you know, we don't, we just don't utilize their wisdom and their usefulness enough. We also have seniors who are just wanting to be left alone and are very apathetic and don't even want to give back. So it's that double-edged sword. A lot of seniors have so much still to give and to serve and the best way to do that is to mentor. And that's what this woman did. She not only allowed me, and she not only answered my ad, which was a very proactive thing to do, but she allowed me in her home. And she mentored me and served me in so many magnificent ways. So many seniors have homes that they could open their homes up, you know, open to. Uh, and not just in their homes, but just to serve the community. And we've lost, it takes a village, you know, we've lost that, those opportunities to be with our neighbors. I, I hardly know anybody in my apartment building. It's so pathetic. I'm about to have a party to welcome all my neighbors so I can know who they are. You know, we all live in this isolation because we now have the internet, which is a global opportunity. It's such an oxymoron, you know, it's such a paradox that we have this tremendous opportunity to reach out to the world and we're living alone. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing. I actually I've done a, quite a few articles and one of them is called um, World Collaborations at Your Fingertips and it's true. We have these world collaborations at our fingertips and yet nobody knows each other on so many levels. People and it's are hungry. Shame. Yeah. It, it, it is a shame and, I, and it is it is a shame that we don't go out and meet our neighbors and that we don't know our neighbors and God forbid there's an emergency we wouldn't be able to knock on the door and say, hey, Tom, you know, could you help me out? Because we don't yeah, even know our neighbors' that's names. That's going to happen real soon. <laughs> we don't even know our neighbors' names. It's just, you know, it, it yeah. is. We need to get out and meet our neighbors. We need to know their names. 
We need to be on a handshake basis. And so that, God forbid, we do need to go to our neighbors, you know, and we should be there for our neighbors anyway. Yeah. Um, it's, I just think it's, it's one of these things that, you know, we need to get away from the boxes and we need to go out there and socialize more. And I have to say, though, the Internet has brought people that, have been dis that are disabled a way to connect. People that cannot get out of beds, cannot, can, that are disabled in a way that they cannot get out, having Google Hangouts, having Skype, I mean, for them, this is an amazing thing to be able to actually see and be able to talk. You know, for this type of thing, I mean, I think the Internet has been an amazing tool. So for that, I'm extremely grateful for the disabled population that they actually get to be able to do this. I'm so glad you mentioned that word, disabled. Yeah. I met this guy in a wheelchair, and I had to tell him my story because I was watching Push Girls, mm. the TV show. I don't, know, I don't know if you have you seen it? I've heard about it. Gorgeous, sexy girls are in these wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, having their careers, then they have their love life. I mean, they have a full, mm -hmm. rich life, and they're disabled. Yep. And one night, I was watching them, and all of a sudden, I had this vision that they were all reading Pushing Upward <laughs> on the show. Like, they were all, you know, having the book in front of them and reading and talking about the book. And I went oh my god, is this a vision or is this a premonition or... Anyway, I was telling him the story and he said, well, I happen to know those girls. Now he's in a wheelchair. I said, you know, we're all kind of disabled, you know, in one way or the other. I mean, we think we're free, but some of the people in jail are freer than we are. Very true. So it's like, so he says, I'm going to introduce your book to one of the people on Push Girls. And I went, that would be amazing. So we'll see what happens. But I'm so, I'm so glad that you mentioned that name because we are all... Oh, we, we, all we all are disabled in some way or another, whether it be we're introverted and we're shy or, you know, everybody... And I don't even like, you know, for me, it's, there's so many terminologies that we use I wish we didn't use. I think we're all, you know, everybody is handicapped or disabled in some way and I wish we had other words that we could use because the reality is I don't know I just wish there were other words <laughs> it's like I don't I don't like to use the word should have could have would have I don't like to use the word try I think there's so many more empowering words that we could use <laughs> or that we could create it's like you tell people lose weight why would you want to lose weight and then find the weight? you lose your keys what do you do you go to find your keys so why are you telling someone to lose weight how about release the weight release the baggage I like that I like that but seriously why are you gonna go lose the weight because anytime you lose something you're gonna you're find it again want to go find it I love that you got to turn that into Oprah you got that's a good I'm one. serious that's what I teach my clients I always tell them why do you use the word diet that's restrictive yeah. I, you know, it's like reframing. Use words that are positive, that are empowering, that are inspiring. Why are you using words that are putting yourself down? It's like I had all these different surgeries, so I'm, you know, I'm heavier than I normally am. And it's not because of me being stuffing my face. I eat extremely healthy. It's because my body, because of the surgeries and anesthesia and you know, all this other stuff, and so my body is now slowly releasing the weight. And it's because I haven't been able to be as active as I normally am. And as you know, as we get older, if we're sedentary, you know, you don't move, no matter what you eat or don't eat. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. You know, but anyways, besides, besides the point, and I, and I had to love and accept myself as I am right now, knowing that I'm, you know, I'm used to being an athlete, so that's just the way it is, and now I am, you know, doing steps I need to do so I can get back to my normal self, and that's okay. But anyways. Yeah, it's amazing, even if we just walk a little bit every day. Yeah, I mean, which I'm doing. You know, yeah. it's, and it's still, it, 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 it's, it's crazy what we do to ourselves. I mean, we torture ourselves. It's, and, it's, and then, of course, that torturing ourselves just keeps the weight on even more because we're beating ourselves up. So while we're eating, and we're, and we're torturing ourselves because we're eating, and it's like, you know, even if you eat, so then, then you go into starvation mode and your body keeps that weight on. It's like, oh, my God. Well, which, I think it's what's even more important than the external dialogue that we're, the, the internal dialogue that we're using, on. it's the internal words. Oh, my and God, the saboteur so internal dialogue that's going on, especially if you had an eating disorder, which I grew up with. So if you have the eating disorder and you grew up with that and your body is going to that internal dialogue, oh, Lord have mercy. You know, seriously, the internal dialogue is, is like... Deadly. Uh, 
deadly. It's absolutely, it's just nuts. So but there was an yeah. exercise that somebody had recommended that I tried for a while. I mean, I try everything a little bit. Um, you put a rubber band on your wrist. Oh yes, the snapping. The snapping. The snapping. And every time a negative thought comes out, you snap. snap. And then you snap it out of your mind as well. Yep. So that was a cool little exercise. And that but really it no, does that work. It's like I, I did a, um, it's the twenty five push ups exercise. Every time you say the words T R Y B U T coulda shoulda woulda, you do twenty five push ups. And what it does is it creates a trigger in your in your body. And it's it's a psychological thing because your body then knows every time you say those words, it's going uh. I don't think so. I'm not saying that works. I'm going to have to do 25 push ups. Right, right. It's the same right. time with the well, band. Really good for you. The band, <laughs> right? Your body is going, uh, I don't think I want to say that works. I'm going to get I'm going to get inflicted with pain. So it's the same thing. I did a course one week and I did 200 push ups in one weekend. I'm going, ooh. So your body, I, I was ingrained for that weekend to never say B U T or A N D or should have, could have, would have. And that was one whole weekend, three days. I think, that, I think the diversity of, you know, it's like the, we, we need to diverse our food so we're mm -hmm. getting all the different kinds of nutrients and minerals. And I think it's the same way with exercise. The more we diversify, you know, our funds, our food, our thoughts, um, our actions, I think it's a really healthy thing to do, you know, whether it's swimming or jogging or walking or jump roping or you know the con and hatha yoga it's the diversity of it that I think keeps it alive rather than doing the same thing every day a really amazing therapeutic thing for your body is rebounding it drains your lymphatic system those little I have a rebounder channels. right here because as a oh, writer I love I rebounding on my butt all day and then oh. I just every hour I get up and I jump oh I love rebounding it is yeah. the most favorite thing in the whole wide world to do Great. I wish Absolutely. I had a big backyard to have a big trampoline and really jump. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dream. Oh my God. Yeah. So let's go back to I love because I I know one of the things I love talking with you is because you have the most one of the most deep metaphysical minds, which is you know it's rare that I get to talk a woman that has a really deep metaphysical mind. I have a lot of men friends that are very deep thinkers, but it's nice to talk to a female that's got a nice deep think mind. <laughs> so I, I love beautiful minds. To me, there's nothing greater than having a beautiful mind to talk to. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit more about this beautiful mind that you have and, and to some of the deeper consciousness realms, shall we say. So the I Ching, I get where you're going with that, but let's talk about where your consciousness stuff began because I think a lot of people, you know, we never know who's listening and you know, I think it's great for people to understand, plant some of those seeds as to give us some tools where people can start to discover a little bit of those consciousness seeds. Like where would someone begin to to just maybe spark some seeds of where to start with consciousness or where to start with meditation or where to start with finding out a little bit about themselves? Well, there's all kinds of meditation practices. You know, there's not one, I'm not a proponent of one. No, I agree. I find that, you know, what I've been doing for several years works for me. But there's Buddhist meditation, there's city yoga meditation, there's uh, Tibetan muted meditation, open eyed meditation, closed eyes meditation. I think it's a matter of just, you know, trying out and going to a few of these organizations and find out what resonates with you. That's the first thing, because there's nothing like being in a group uh, and sitting with a group to dive inside. It's really a great support situation, and that's how I started. Um, and now I pretty much do my meditation alone. In fact, I prefer it, uh, but it took me years. And it's like going to the gym. You don't go to the gym and lift a 500 pound bar the first time you want to work out. You work up gradually. So you try a 5 pound bar and then a 7 and maybe go to an 8 or a 10. But it's a gradual process. In the same way, you can't expect 
yourself to sit down and meditate for three hours the first time. It's sometimes even hard to meditate for five minutes the first time. People think that they have to stop all their thoughts and that's not true. What you want to do or try to achieve is quieting the mind, just allowing it to slow down. And you can choose a mantra. You can just use the word OM and focus on OM. I prefer closed-eyed meditation, so I close my eyes and I have a mantra. And I repeat that on the in-breath and the out-breath. And you can do that with just the word OM. And begin to watch your thoughts, you know, like a movie playing in front of you without getting attached to any one thought. Because the minute you attach yourself to one thought, you're disputing the process. So you're letting things go. You're watching them come, you're watching them go, and you become more and more detached from the thoughts that you think you need to be in control of. And so once that begins to happen and you get used to watching these thoughts and not getting attached to them and watching them move in and out, stay focused on the mantra and you will spontaneously and very effortlessly begin to watch your heart slow down and your thoughts slow down. And eventually they disappear. So there have been times where I've been able to meditate for three hours. When I was in India, I used to go to what was called the cave. And I would literally sit down at three in the morning and get up at six and feel like it was five minutes. But, you know, it doesn't happen right away. It takes years of practice. And for one to get good at anything, like... Um, Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to become a master at anything. I believe that, whether it's a master of meditation, a master of the piano. I believe my son has mastered the drums. I think he's played 20,000 hours <laughs> just practicing. But he can now play the tabla and the merdung and the drum kit. And he's masterful at composing and drumming. And it's because he spent so many hours being disciplined and learning the fundamentals and now able to become this amazing composer and jazz musician. So monkey see monkey do, you know, he saw me at the computer every single day, you know, very disciplined. He saw me very disciplined in meditation and he became very disciplined. This is the best way we can be parents is by being disciplined ourselves and people and our kids watch us you can't say one thing and do another it doesn't work so I'm kind of drifting off here to never never land but you talk about consciousness and you talk about discipline and you know I loved writing about discipline I wrote it about it in both my books creating an abundant practice and the science of spiritual marketing that there's this magnificent friction that takes place when we even think of the word discipline because it has such a negative connotation. But in fact, it's the best thing we can bring into our lives because by being disciplined, we create tremendous freedom. That also sounds like a paradox, but it's true. The more disciplined I am with my spiritual practices, the more freedom I experience in my mind, in my thoughts, in my consciousness, the more I connect with the people that I want to connect with, and your whole life just has this flow that I don't think I would have without this in my life. I agree completely with you on that. I think discipline is freedom. I don't think people realize that. When you're not disciplined, you actually create chaos, and with chaos, you do not have freedom. <laughs> you actually become chained to chaos, yeah. literally a ball and chain. 
So yes, discipline definitely does create freedom. And with that, I'm going to let everyone know that we are on Intention Radio. And please make sure you check them out. And please be sure to check out the Intention Call, a wonderful call that happens on Saturdays. And they basically intend on whether it be world peace or love. They just basically take something and they basically have a group intention. So please go check them out. Intention Radio has a beautiful group of wonderful hosts. And all of their hosts are people that have shows like this, all about conscious and, uh, I, I mean, just literally every single show is about consciousness and whatever, you know, everything is spirituality. It's just a great, great channel to be on. So please go check out intentionradio.com. And we are going to finish out this show, and Andrea's going to give us some wonderful tips. Please make sure you check out her book, Pushing Upwards. You can find it on Amazon and going to pushingupwards.com. And um, please welcome back Andrea Adler. And we are going to wrap up the show with some beautiful, wonderful golden nuggets from Andrea. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, you know, you mentioned golden nuggets, and I reflect back on Emma in this story, Pushing Upward. And it's Pushing Upward, not plural. Pushing, I'm sorry, pushingupward.com. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and one of the golden nuggets that she gave me was the phrase, don't let the daggers of doubt puncture your heart. And it was a phrase that kept me going even after I left being around her. Don't let the daggers of doubt puncture your heart. And we have our own doubts. We have other people doubting us. I remember when I was an actress and so many people would say, why are you even doing this? It's so competitive. And I got to Broadway because I was only in competition with myself and I always knew that and it's something I taught my son as well. We're only in competition with ourselves and when he tried to get into New England Conservatory of Music which only takes you know two or three drummers a year it's not like other schools that you just pay thirty five or forty thousand dollars a year and you get in they only take a few drummers. Who was he in competition with? Himself. And he got in. And now I'm experiencing it again with this book becoming a film. Well, the percentages of books that become films are very, very few. Is that going to stop me? I don't think so. Am I trying to connect the dots to find the right producers for this film? Yes. Am I very selective? You bet. I've turned down a few people already. So don't let the daggers of doubt puncture your heart or stop you from pursuing your dream and what you know is true for yourself. I think that's the best nugget I can leave with the audience today. And as always, people, I will create a fabulous page and you can find anything you could possibly want to know about Andrea Adler and her book. And I love bringing you valuable content and I love your feedback. So please be willing to leave feedback and any questions you have, I'm more than happy to answer for you. For tonight, it is good night. And I love you guys and many blessings to everybody. And Thank you very I much, Carly. Oh, absolutely. I love hanging out with you. I know we can have, me and you could go on forever and ever. Down the rabbit hole we could go. <laughs> and, and many, in many directions indeed. And I look forward to hanging out with you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us. And till next time, have a beautiful night, everybody. You Good too. Night. Good night. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you.